let me start by just giving you a little example. So, a um, parent came to me, so if my child is so smart, and I have said this to parents, you have a very bright child here, then they said, well, if he's so smart, and you're telling me he's so smart, why is he so slow? So this parent says this, I can see why everyone is so frustrated with Dennis because I'm frustrated with him too. He can't get anything done on time, whether it's his homework, putting on his shoes, or taking down a phone message, he can't get it done. He gets so excited about writing a history paper, when it comes time to actually do the paper, he just sits there staring at the pencil, taking forever to write things down or look things up. If I didn't know him so well, I think he just didn't care. But I know he does. His dad thinks he's lazy, his teacher thinks he just doesn't care, and I'm spending my life yelling at him to get things done. How did we get into this mess? So, real story, um, real kid, and like I said earlier today, dad really just argued with me, he's just lazy, you're wrong. And I've heard that a lot from parents. Like, it's like, you're, you're not right, you don't understand, he's just lazy. So, you already know the answer to this, because I already kind of gave it away, but it's not really a trick question. So a lot of times, when I read that kind of a scenario like that, parents say, well, or people, professionals say, it's just a kid with ADHD. But it's not quite so simple as you know. So it's not just finding the kid with the ADHD, but also the kid who doesn't have ADHD who also has these kinds of issues. So again, I, I already reviewed this with you, but so what is processing speed? Again, it's that how long it takes a kid to complete a task in a certain amount of time. I already talked about this and just as a review in terms of executive functioning skills and processing speed being the engine that drives the car. So, and I talked about this as well too. So it's um, the cost of having slower processing speed. Um, they're pretty significant. And we find that kids with processing speed deficits have deficits in all of these areas. So kids who have slower processing speed have difficulty processing spoken language fluently. They can't get things written down on paper. They don't have good reading fluency skills, meaning if we just have them read a passage and just time them, they're slower than, than average. Kids with these kinds of issues are slower at reading and writing. Even though they don't have a learning disability, they just take longer to do all of those kinds of things. Again, they have trouble sustaining attention to tasks, not because they have a, necessarily a primary attention problem, but because the information's coming in so quickly, their attention is lost. So that's a very different thing to think about. So somebody who just doesn't attend um, has a very different kinds of problem than kids who are like, can't attend because it's just all coming in so fast, but who may be able to attend quite well if the tempo and the pace is more at their level. They, again, have difficulty understanding directions quickly. Think about how quickly a um, school setting or generally in life things happen. These kids have trouble with that. Um, they have trouble retrieving information from long-term memory. They have problems finishing almost anything and problems with social interactions too. And I think I, and I'll probably, I, I think I have a slide similar to the one I showed this morning. These problems with social interactions, there's something that was reported by parents a lot. And I would scratch my head and say, well, I don't know why I'd have problems with social interactions. He seems like a pretty social kid to me. But when we looked at our own data, we found that these kids have really high problems with social interactions. And you think about what social interactions demand. It demands quick thinking on your feet. It kind of demands us to look at a situation, kind of hear what lots of different people are saying and to walk in and to engage. And these kids can't do that, even though they don't really have social problems. They're not odd kids. They just have problems communicating and interacting quickly. So I already showed you this. We know also that our world is just getting faster and that things are moving at such a fast pace that kids who were even just slightly slow might be even more deficient or more compromised than they would have been 20, 30, even 10 years ago. There are these three different kinds of uh, processing speeds. The verbal processing, the visual processing, and the motor processing. And all of these interact together. So even though a child might have a primary process or problem in visual processing, doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have problems with motor speed or verbal processing skills. 
So it's complicated. So what do these kids look like? Well, they don't look like kind of a simple sort of kid who's just, you know, not trying. They might look, and one, I think somebody brought this, this question up, or I know they brought this question up, is that one time, at one point, they might look just fine, and the next time they may look like they can't get anything done at all. These kinds of kids may look confused, they may appear absent-minded because they're unable to process the information at a rate that it's being delivered. They may avoid just engaging in tasks altogether, not because they don't want to do it, not because they really like not engaging, but because they just can't, they know they're not going to be able to get it done. I, I told you before too that these are kids who just don't all, always have good ideas about how long it's going to take them to complete a task. The ones that do have a good idea about how long it's going to take them to complete the task think, I'm not going to get it done anyway, so I even bother getting started. So it's, and I find that it's either one or the other, either kids who are like, don't worry about it, I can get it done. You know, I, I told you a little bit about, I have a son with this kind of processing speed problem, and you might notice already that I don't have that kind of problem <laughs> with how fast I talk, and so it's a bad interaction. I'll talk a little bit about family interactions, but it's a bad interaction when a kid who's kind of slow has a family member or a parent who's like, let's get going, let's keep going. So, it's, um, so they may, um, for example, look at a task and think that they're going to pace their task behaviors on you. So for example, with my son, this just gives you a little example. He graduated from high school and I said, all right, you've got to write your thank you notes. Now, again, as is the case with most of these kids, fine motor skills, especially with boys, tend to be really slow. It takes them a long time to write notes, to take notes. And so thank you notes are never any 17 or 18 year old boy's favorite thing to do. He just said, mom, I don't know what you're talking about. I, you know, he wrote like the first 10 to the most important people, grandma and that sort of thing, and, and then left the other 40 the entire summer. And I would say, Peter, let's just, why don't you just do like two every day or do five on Tuesday and another five. D Mom, don't worry, it's gonna take me like 20 minutes to do them. Like, so you're saying it's gonna take you 30 seconds for each, <laughs> for each, and he really thought it was true. Of course, as we're driving to take him to college, did he get the thank you notes done? He did not. But for him, he, he, was, he made sure that grandma got her note and anybody who was going to give him another gift for Christmas got the thank you <laughs> note. However, he just never did them because he miscalculated how long it was going to take him. All of the things that I gave him to do to try and organize him, like I don't need it plus it was summer and you know as a parent I'm thinking well, it was his last summer home he's working full time you know so he anyway it gives you an idea so he just didn't do them and he never got them done the other thing I also talked about is some of these kids um, cope by rushing through their work and in about what I'm finding is about 20% of the cases with these kinds of kids parents will I'll say based on their cognitive test data this kid needs extra time on tests. He needs extra time to do everything. He's at like the fifth percentile in terms of processing speed on the Wexler Intelligence Scale for children. And the parents will say to me, I don't, I don't know why he would need that because he's the first, the teacher tells me he's the first one done in class all the time. Now, did he finish the test? No, probably not. Did he leave the whole back section not done? Yes. But these kids, some of these kids would rather be they'd rather flunk the test and be the first one done than to be the last one done and to do well. It doesn't sound like a really good coping mechanism for us who, listening to this, but for them, it makes sense. So for those kids, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about what to do with these kids. For those kids, giving them extended time, but not teaching them why they need to take extended time, not teaching them that extended time is not a shameful thing, it's, it, it, and that's part of the, the process for them, because they'll just rush through. So again, they may finish their work um, quickly, even though they haven't answered every question, and they just feel like, well, at least I did something. At least I was the first one done. And for them, that's, that's actually completing the task, when really we know it's not. So I wanted to give you a little sense of how we assess processing speed. So you can see some of the different kinds of instruments we use to get a sense of where a child is. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with the WISC. Do you guys know that? Okay. So just to give any, first of all, any test that's time is, is a measure of processing speed. It's a measure of how kids can actually keep up. So a couple of the things that we use, um, for instance, the WISC coding test is 
each number is paired with a symbol. And what the child has to do is use that, that code to actually put in the symbols that go along with the numbers. So when you think about this, it's a task where they have to shift set. Remember I talked about that ability to kind of go from one thing to the next and then use their fine motor skills, their visual processing skills to do something very quickly. This test is really highly correlated with a child's ability to take notes in class. So if you can't do this on a single sheet of paper, think about what you have to do when you just have to copy your assignment from the board. You have to look, you have to write down, you have to kind of keep a code in your head at the same time. So if a child comes out at the fifth percentile on this, or even the 20th percentile on this, they're gonna be in the bottom fifth percent, you know, the bottom uh, quarter of kids their age, or the bottom fifth percentile for the kids their age at being able to do this. So um, having the expectation that a child can quickly kind of do this is inappropriate, really, because they can't. Another kind of test, and this is from a, a younger version of the, it's from the WIPSI, they have to look at a certain target symbol and then mark the one that's the same. So that's, again, a very simple kind of visual processing skill. This one uses more of those fine motor skills. That one uses less fine motor skills, but a lot more of the visual processing skills. Um, and this is another kind of test that, <clears throat> where in this one, they have to look at two different target shapes and cross out all the red squares and all the yellow triangles without crossing out anything else. So, um, and they have to do it kind of in a line. So it's not like they can just look at the whole page and just cross, cross, cross. On this particular one, they have to do it and they can't go back. So they have to kind of balance the ability to kind of quickly look at this with the ability to not go too quickly. So we look in these kids, well, how fast did they get through? And then how many did they miss? Or how many did they miss right because they were going too quickly, overcompensating for their problems? So another kind of test that we use to just measure um, verbal processing skills is just to see how quickly a child can read something or how quickly they can, um, for instance, read these words. So we've got three different words, red, green, blue, green, red, blue, red. You can kind of look at this. And we just time how long or how far they get in like 45 seconds, for example. So it gives us very gross kind of, you know, very simple kind of measure of just their verbal processing skills on a very simple task. And another portion of this task, we look at how quickly they can name colors. This is a little bit more difficult. So reading words is something that's automatic. Once we become good readers, it's automatic. We can't not read words quickly. This actually has to, we're retrieving something a little bit more difficult, where we're retrieving an actual name as opposed to reading a word. So on this one, all they have to do is blue, red, green, I guess it's supposed to be green, blue, green, red. So we're timing how quickly they can just kind of visually process something and get the word out. On this one, I don't know if you, how many of you know what's coming here, is on this one, we're asking them to not read the word, but to tell me what word the color, what color the word is printed in. So just kind of try that to yourself for a minute. See how hard that is. <clears throat> So this gets a little bit more complicated. In this um, instance, we're not just measuring how quickly they do, but how well they can inhibit the normal response. So how quickly can they, our normal response is to just read red, green, blue, green, red, blue, but we want them to inhibit that response. That would be our normal response, not say the word, and then say the color. So blue, red, green, blue. It's hard to even shift back and forth once you start to read the word. So it gives us a, a much more subtle kind of um, measure of how quickly they can do a more complicated kind of processing speed subtest or test where they actually have to also inhibit a response. So kids with these kinds of deficits tend to do poorly on multiple <laughs> kinds of tests like this. Another test that we um, use is called trails A and B. And there are a couple of different measures of this. This, this is a simple one that's used in kids under the age of 14. So just take a look at this and then um, see if you can just quickly kind of connect the dots. And that's all we're asking kids to do here is connect the dots on the page. And the, if you can imagine this on just a, a, a normal kind of eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, kids who are slower at this just have trouble kind of figuring out, okay, I need to get a lay of the land here. I know one, two, three, they, it just takes them longer to kind of figure out where they're going. 
other thing, just anecdotally, that I also find with kids with ADHD is they tend to not see that 15. They tend to get to 14 and then just have trouble finishing. Now, the directions for this test, just to let you know, I'll, I'll say to them, they first practice on, on a different one, a different piece of paper, and then I give them the real one, and I say, okay, now I want you to connect the dots as quickly as you can, and I point to starting with number one and ending with number 15. Ready, go. So same kids who just 20 seconds before, I pointed to the number 15, they'll get to 14, and they'll go, I just don't know where it is. So it's up there in the corner. So they tend to even be slower at things that were just pointed out to them, and also inattentive. Now, this part of, of the trail making test is a little bit more complicated. In this portion of the test, what they're asked to do is alternate between numbers and letters. So just take a moment and see if you can do that. So for example, 1A, 2B. See if that makes sense to you and you can kind of see that. It's a lot more difficult and it's for a couple of reasons. One is that you have to keep two things in mind at the same time. You gotta keep numbers, the order of the numbers, and the order of the letters. And then, the other part of this is that you have to alternate between the two. You have to shift set. You have to go from one thing to the next. This is a very um, good test for people who have trouble with executive functions in general. Even in adults who tend to have, for instance, head injuries, or suffering from dementia, they tend to struggle on this test um, very much. And it's a little bit more, this is kind of, a, again, a simpler version for kids under the age of 15. It's a little bit more complicated. It just has more numbers and letters for adults. But it's one of those tests that's very simple, but it's very, very selective in terms of its ability to um, show people who are having difficulties in these kinds of areas.